Amen. I, I want to share with you from this subject, combating the pervading and dominating spirits of this age. I'm going to say it again. Combating the pervading and dominating spirits of this age. And as a subtitle, what's happening behind the scenes? The question is being asked, what's really going on? What's really going on? What's really going on? I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 24, because Jesus sets the stage. As we all know, we're living in the last days and he begins to characterize for us what the spirit of the last days will be like. And so we have to understand that the age that we are in now has a characteristic. And if we can understand that, we'll also know how we are supposed to conduct ourselves. Here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, it reads this way. And I want to just selectively take two verses at the start here. Matthew 24, verse 4, and then Matthew 24, verse 24. Once again, Matthew 24, verse 4, and then Matthew 24, verse 24. All right. Verse four says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. He is talking about the last days and he's talking about what is going to characterize the last days. And so the mere fact that he brings up, be not deceived, let no man deceive you. He's telling us it's going to be a time of deception. So that is one thing that you and I are going to have to combat which is the spirit of deception. Verse 24 says this, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much, get this, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So now what this says to us is that what characterizes the last days is a time of deception. And we understand who our enemy is. Our enemy is not a brother. Our enemy is not a sister. Our enemy is not uh, some man, some physical person. But our enemy is Satan himself, who is a master of deception. And so he has a multiplicity of, of ways in which to uh, inflict that mode of operandi upon the human family. So deception Deception is what's going to characterize the time that we are now come into. Yes. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, it says this. Again, talking about what is characterizing the last days. The Apostle Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men, listen to this, but evil men and seducers. Evil men and seducers. You put wickedness together in the same verbiage. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So in other words, the characteristics of these last days, the Bible says it's going to be full of evil people and seducers, and it's going to get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Notice the next phrase, deceiving and being deceived. Now here it is. What characterizes this hour is people are given over to the spirit of deception. And they themselves don't even know that they're deceived. They are being used to deceive others, but they don't know that they themselves are deceived. And so even the best, even those who think that they have freedom in this world, even those who think that they're, they're, they align with Satan's kingdom as if Satan has some favorites, as if he does not plan to destroy all of humanity, they themselves are being used to deceive, but they themselves are deceived. That's a travesty. Now here the Apostle Paul is talking about the level of influence that Satan has over, over men. They will deceive others, yet themselves will be deceived. So in other words, the deceiver is deceived. I'm going to say that again. The deceiver is deceived. Now we're dealing with systems. We're dealing with systems of wickedness in the last days. And so it is, it is incumbent upon us as the people of God to be prepared to come back Deception. Now, what does it mean to combat? It means to take action, to redu reduce or prevent something bad or undesirable. So in other words, if we don't want to succumb to deception, we have to take steps to make sure that we can reduce it from happening to us or prevent it 
from becoming something that we just find ourselves falling prey to. In other words, it's just happening without us being aware that it's happening. So here, the word pervading, and I want to drive this home because I want to teach this because we have to understand what we're dealing with. We're asking the question, what's really happening? This word pervading, it is of an influence, a feeling or a quality to present or apparent throughout. So if it's pervading, it is being presented and it is apparent throughout. In other words, it's running through the fiber of our world now. It's, it's running through every system now. Everything is designed to keep us either deceived or in the dark. Stay with me. Especially of a smell spread through and be perceived in every part to permeate. So if Satan is going to wreak havoc, and cause massive destruction, he has to do it through utilizing wiles. The Bible tells us about the wiles of the devil. We'll get to that in Ephesians. But we got to understand that he has many wiles to use. And all of them are converging together. They're all converging together. It means to permeate and to penetrate. So when I'm speaking about pervading influences, I'm speaking about what the devil most prominently uses in this hour against all people. No one is exempt. So this 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 battle is being raised against the entire human family. So dominate. Have a commanding influence. Satan must have a commanding influence over humanity in order to to wreak havoc, in order to destroy, in order to work out his dark agenda in the earth. He must have a commanding influence upon all people. It means to exercise control over to master or to subjugate. Or tyrannicize, tyrannicize. And we understand that a tyrant, literally, he begins to master or subjugate everybody through using his wicked influence. So Satan has to very subtly exude his influence unaware over us all. But what I'm declaring to you and I right now is God has given you and I the wherewithal to combat all the wiles of the devil. Why? Because he has given us his word. So what are we dealing with? I want to deal with four commanding spirits of the last days. Number one, deceiving spirits. Deceiving spirits. And you want to see how through the systems of the world, all of these spirits are at work and in play right now. The number two spirit, beguiling spirits. Number th- three, blinding spirits. And number four, manipulating spirits. Once again, number one, deceiving spirits. Number two, beguiling spirits. Number four, blinding spirits. Number five, manipulating spirits. Now, it is, of, it, is, it is of God's desire for you and I not to be under the influence of any one of these. In other words, not for them to hold sway over us because we're children of the, of the light, not of the night. We're children of the day, not of the night. So in other words, we should be able to discern the operation of these four spirits at work in the world as they're trying to bear rule over the whole of the human population. Now, there are four pervasive tactics being used to wear, to raise warfare against the church and the human family. They all fit under one category, the wiles of the devil. I'm going to say it again. All four of these spirits are working in the world. They fit under 
the tactics that Satan uses to rage warfare. They all are called the wiles of the devil. It seems inconceivable that so many people would be controlled in this hour and would not even be aware of its influence and work in establishing a stronghold upon even the elect of God and the many millions that are under these four pervasive influences. Our Lord declared that the time right before his return would be characterized by unprecedented deception. So if we understand this, we're living in an hour of great deception, but we're also living in an hour of great truth. Why? Because God himself has given you and I his word. He's given you and I the spirit of truth. So in other words, the only thing that helps us combat error and deception is the spirit of truth living within us. Now, the level of deception bore such strong influence that the elect, think about this now, Jesus said that it is even possible for the elect to be deceived. Why? Because Satan is the God of this world system. As long as we plug into the system, it is possible for us to be deceived. But we are to operate outside of the system. Come on, say amen. 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 So the level of deception bore such strong influence that the elect, the bride of Christ, the believers, the saints of the most high God could even themselves find themselves under the sway of massive deception. I'm telling you, saints of God, there is an all out assault of Satan's kingdom right now to deceive the entire world, the entire world. The entire world. So we have to understand that this hour, its characterization is that of deception. Also beguiling influences, blinding spirits at work and manipulation. So when it comes to the elect of God, the believer is the only one who has the proven strategy not to succumb to the wiles of the devil. Now, I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Because all of these things that are happening, all of these things that are seemingly happening simultaneously, seemingly caught the world unawares, but at the same time, the thing that is most striking, that it also caught the church unawares. Because we cannot believe what we see and hear at face value. Come on. Mm. We must be the kind of people that intuitively by the spirit of a living God start asking questions, not of the world, but asking questions of God. What is really happening here? Now, in Ephesians chapter six, verse 11 and 12, it says, Put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against prince of palities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world. Notice of this world against spiritual wickedness. In high places. But verse 11 says, for we need to put on the whole number of God to stand against. In other words, we have to put up a stand against the wiles of the devil. And if we don't know what the wiles are, we don't know the methods that he is using. We cannot stand up against it. So this word wiles, it means craftiness. He's crafty. It means cunningness. It means willingness. He is so willful, intent on accomplishing his wicked agenda, he will go to any extent to accomplish it. It means shrewdness or the word ruse, which means an action intended 
to decease. In other words, what Satan will do is so intent on making sure that we are deceived that he won't stop doing what he's doing. It means to trick, use devices, contrivance. It means subterfuge. And that word subterfuge means to deceive. Uh, 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 this, uh, it means to deceive. In other words, used devices to achieve a goal. So in other words, he keeps using devices to achieve the goal. What is the goal? Deceit. Deceit. What does he use? Guile. What does he use? Beguilement. So Satan has not stopped doing what he did on the first family from the very beginning. There is nothing new under the sun. So he operates the same exact way. But I want you to begin to understand something from the time that Adam and Eve encountered him to the to the now time. Satan now has formidable weaponry and other means now because technology now Knowledge has increased, so now he has a multiplicity of ways to do the same thing that he did to Adam and Eve. So we have to understand that the Bible calls him the God of this world. What world? System. So he uses the systems perfectly, skillfully, and strategically to blind minds, to deceive. What I'm saying is we cannot take things at first value. Amen. So what we got to understand is that Satan is just not using simple tactics aimed at just getting us to sin. That's not even what he's concerned about. Little sin is not what he's concerned about or to miss the mark. That's low level operations to trip us up to sin. That's just low level. High, uh, his daily high level operations has to do with his ability to deploy mass tactics that alter what we believe and think based on misinformation. Misinformation and false information is his greatest weapon to defeat the child of God, but also to hold his sway over all humans. Watch this now. Misinformation. And false information, misinformation, in other words, just like he did with Eve. What did he do? He used the word of God deceitfully. What did he give her? False information. What is he still using? Misinformation and false information. Misinformation, in other words, I omit things, but I also use false information at the same time. So in other words, I don't give you all of the truth. I, mis I, I misconstrue the truth. And I give you false information. And, and the, the, the worst thing to do is for us to think about how long did it take for Satan to literally beguile Eve? And what was his voice like? Was he, you know, uh, uh, just some, uh, you know, fly by night kind of a situation in his conversation and communication with her? No, he was smooth with his word. He was a soft talker. He was so convincing. Glory to God. So, so we got to understand that Satan is still operating the same way. He understands how to strategically use communication in a soft way that even if you're deceitfully and beguiling someone, they'll believe you just because you're, you're talking in a soft manner. You're talking in such a, a manner that you're so convincing that even people who look at your persuasive attitude will say they can't be telling the, an untruth. But that same beguiling influence is what's being used through systems. And, and, and one of my pet peeves is media, and I'll get to that. Because it's one of the most strategic ways that Satan is using deceit to beguile, seduce, to enslave, to blind the masses. And notice this. Therefore, his systems and methods must become what people will naturally trust. In other words, Satan always uses something to deceive, beguile, to blind the masses, because people have grown used to trusting them. 
His goal is not just to defeat the church, but also to enslave all humans. This is an ancient fallen archangel who uses many organized devices through multiple systems, methods, technology, technical advances, and communicational systems to deceive, beguile, manipulate, and to blind minds. I'm going to say it again. This is an ancient fallen archangel. The, the mere fact that I use ancient, which means that what he's been doing, he's been doing it for a long time, who uses many organized devices through multiple systems, methods, technical advances, and communication systems to deceive, yes. beguile, manipulate, and to blind minds. These tactics are ancient and proven. They are ancient and proven. Go to Romans chapter 16. Now, I want to teach this because God wants you and I to be able to come back the spirit of the age that we are living in. Romans chapter 16, verse 18, and this is the Amplified Bible Classic. Notice what it says. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites and base desires. And by agitating and flattering speech, notice these words, by agitating, oh, here's a word, by ingratiating, by ingratiating and flattering speech, they beguile the hearts of the unsuspecting and simple-minded people. Notice again, ingratiating and flattering words. In other words, these are skills. These are skills that are perfected. Satan uses his agents in this world who they, they have perfected the artistry of ingratiating and flattering speech. It is an art. They beguile the hearts of unsuspecting and simple-minded people. Beguile the hearts of the unsuspecting and simple-minded people is what Satan is endeavoring to do. So in other words, if we are unsuspecting, we are, we are literally finding ourselves operating under the influence of deceiving, beguiling, blinding influences of manipulation. This statement holds the truth behind the methods of the devil's use of devices. Here it is, smooth talking, melatonin speaking. I'm gonna say it again. Smooth talking, melatonin speaking with a sincere voice is often used to establish credibility. Now I want you to tie that to the media. Smooth talking, melatonin speaking with a sincere voice to, which is often used to establish credibility. These are tactics. When this is established, the trap of deception has already been spawned. Why? Because we began to buy into the tone which establishes credibility of the voice. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's truth about to come. But as a stage being set, an atmosphere being set, Satan has set up Masterful systems of, of, of communication, which traps the minds of massive numbers of people, thus accomplishing proven methods to enslave minds. He establishes beliefs which captivate it. People believe when the communicator is convincing. I'm going to say it again. People believe when the communicator is Convincing. That's why we have 24 hour bombardment of communication through media. Why? Because it must become convincing. Are you still here? So convincing communicator of deception doesn't just use the art of communication, but also visual aids to reinforce a manipulative outcome. And that's why technology has become so great because 
You have the communication, but then you have the visual aid. The visual aid, if, if, if you're not caught by the communication, you have to be caught by the visualization. So first is communication, then it's visualization to convince you of a thing. And that's what Satan did with Eve. He first used communication to produce visualization. So he used communication and then he used visualization by getting her to begin to think on the images that he was painting for her. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. See, there's nothing new under the sun, but Satan still operates the same way. He just has greater means, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. greater access, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. greater technology to use, mm -hmm. greating, uh, greater convincing methods now. Mm -hmm. Because we see a thing, we believe a thing. No, the just shall live by faith. Here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent, notice I want you to see his behavior, his characteristics. Now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, Can it really be that God has said, You shall not eat from Every tree of the garden. Notice this. As a result, the way that he operated, as a result of the smooth talking, crafty communication of the serpent, Eve was beguiled or deceived. We must be aware that in this hour, Satan has perfected the art of deception using beguiling influences with precision. We must be aware that Eve's deception was systematic and it took time. It took time and subtlety. Eve gives us the exact strategy of devices or wiles that Satan used against her. We are living in the hour that people are not able to discern what to believe because they don't know how to judge what is true from error. Satan Devises, Satan's devices are more advanced. The spirit of truth still separates the truth from error and falsehood from what is factually true. So now for you and I, when deception is being spawned, the Holy Spirit rises up on the inside of us and there's an error alert. Because, because when, whenever Something is trying to, or a new software is trying to be downloaded on the hardware of our mind. The Holy Spirit says, no, that, that, that there's a virus trying to come in here. He sends an error message. He, he begins to warn us that no, 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 that, that's not true. And so in other words, we're not in the business of believing all things. We judge all things. We judge them. We judge them by the spirit. Amen. Amen. And so Satan devises a more advanced, but the spirit of truth still separates the truth from error and falsehood. Now, look at look at uh, Genesis chapter three, verse 13. Amplify classic again. Notice what Eve tells us after God questions her. She tells us what Satan used to beguile her. The Lord said unto the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled, cheated, outwitted, and deceived me, and I ate. He beguiled, he cheated, outwitted, and deceived me and I ate. Somebody's mic is open right there. So now we're dealing with the beguiling influence. Two things, deception and beguilement. Satan deploys all four of them. Deception, beguilement, 
blinding influence, and manipulation. I'm going to say it again. Deception, beguilement, blinding influence, and manipulation. And so he said, she said, the serpent beguiled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, he charmed, enchanted her. To charm, to attract, to enchant. He got an entrance. Why? Because she did not refute the error. See, we, we got to refute error. We, see, 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 the Holy Ghost sends up that, uh, that error alert system on the in, that, that message on the inside of us. And we begin to discern that there's something wrong here. I may not be able to put my finger on it, but I'll pray through it long enough for the Holy Ghost to show me there's something wrong here. So now at face value, I don't I don't willingly just accept this thing because I got an error alert on the inside of me. Now I'm praying through God. Give me clarity. What's really going on here? Yes, Lord God. And so this word beguile, see, Satan, Satan has to captivate. He has to get an entrance. He has to enchant. He has to charm. You know, he's got to win us, win us over. Listen, deception is a form of bewitchment. It is to spellbind. That's, that, that, that's why, you know, we can spend hours on it. And I know that to be true of myself. And this is something that I'm going to break myself out of in this, sin, this season. That, that you can become spellbind bound by watching something long enough. Mm. It means to dazzle. It means to hypnotize because once you get hypnotized, I can just download into your your hardware software. I I can inflict something into your hardware and begin to alter your values and what you believe, your ideas. I can begin to mess up your hardware. It means to seduce. It means to ensnare. It means to entrap. Again, the same word is synonymous with beguilement, deceive. Notice this in Galatians chapter 1, I mean 3 verse 1. I'm still in the Amplified Classic. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Because, I, see, see what we, these words, bewitch, we wouldn't characterize them with what we might be experiencing in our world or nation. But that's exactly what's happening. Why? Because we got to understand that we are in this world, but not of this world. We govern our lives by a whole different kingdom. Amen. That, that is founded upon revelation knowledge of God's word. And so we are in the system, but we are not of the system. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We operate outside of this world. We operate from a heavenly kingdom, and that kingdom has intel. Glory to God. And so because it has intel, even though these influences are taking place, we can see them for what they are. Here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. I'm not using this in a theological sense. I'm not using this from a standpoint of trying to be hermeneutically correct. I'm using this from a principle standpoint. Notice what he says, because it's possible to become bewitched. He says, oh, you poor and silly and thoughtless, unreflecting. Here it is, unreflecting. If there's something we must do in this hour is reflect. We have to. You, you can't let your mind shut down. You can't check your mind out. Unreflecting and senseless Galatians who has fascinated or bewitched or cast a spell over you. Unto whom right before your very eyes, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was openly and graphically set forth and portrayed and cru- crucified. So here, the point is, it is possible to be bewitched. Why? Because this word bewitch, it carries the same, the same definition as being deceived. Beguiled. So why is deception possible where there are some who cannot... Uh, uh, so why deception... Why is deception possible where there are some who can detect it 
and others who succumb to its influence. Now, think, think about this again. Why is deception possible where there are some who can detect it and others who succumb to its influence? Here's your answer. It has to do with the maturity and having been developed to discern the characteristics of its operation. When one is mature in spiritual matters, it becomes a function of the spirit. Now, your ability to detect deception, beguilement, spiritual blindness or blinding influences or manipulations, it comes from becoming spiritually mature in spiritual matters. It becomes a function of the spirit. It is the same principle that governs spiritual development that's used to detect or discern the operation of, of discerning spirits, beguiling spirits, blinding spirits, and manipulating spirits. So now, let me say it again. Let me go back. Now, when you and I are spiritually developed, we have the operation of our inner man, our spirit. Because we are spiritually developed, that means we're spiritually mature. We are able to discern. Now, that is a function of having matured. Then we can discern deceiving spirits, beguiling spirits, blinding spirits, and manipulating spirits. This is why those who have not been trained or taught in this hour will find themselves unable to avoid the influence of the wiles of the devil. Now that's not supposed to be true of us. You and I as believers, we should be able to detect any trace of deception that's being used through any one of the devices that Satan chooses to use them or when he releases a certain wile. Hebrews chapter 5. I want you to go there real quick. So it has to do with, here's my point, it has to do with being developed, trained, and being mature in spiritual matters. I hope by now, you and I have come to the point where we don't believe everything we hear when we listen to the newscasts. Mm. The Bible says, test all things, prove all things. Test all things, prove all things. Ephesians, well, I tell you, go, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 to 14. Notice what it says. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, that speaks of maturity, even those who by reason of use have their senses, this is spiritual senses, exercise to discern both good and evil. So now there is, a, there is a maturity level in us that we can detect, we can discern, we can discern. It, you know, that scratchy feeling comes on the inside of you. You know, that still small voice, you start to hear God speaking. No, no, there's something wrong about this here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Many of the things that are happening and I see people still not able to put their finger on what's going on. Taking it at face value. We, we believe the experts. We believe our politicians. We believe our mayors. We believe our governors. But we've come to find out that all of them have been wrong. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11 through 15. This is how God's design that you and I can become deception proof. That, that we will not succumb to deceiving spirits, beguiling spirits, blinding influences, spirits, manipulating spirits. Ephesians chapter 11 verse, I mean 411 through 15, it says this. And he gave some. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, mature man. So all of that, all that God has given is so that we would become mature. And then he tells us why. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's why. That we be henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children. That speaks of immature, tossed to and fro. Notice the words. And carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight, you know, the slight of men. You know, when I think about the slight of men, I, I, I think about three card Molly. I think about, you know, you know, being in the in the in the streets in the summer back in the back when I was a teenager. And they used to use I don't know what the game they used to call it, but, you know, they, they take the three cups and they put uh, something under one cup and they show it, show it to you in the hand. And then they put it in the cup and all of a sudden if 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 you're not watching the hands and you're watching the face. You don't know where that thing went. You thought you saw it, but you didn't see it. The slight, the slight of men, the slight of men, that, that's trickiness of men and the cunning craftiness. In other words, the reason why God has given us those who help train us and develop us, D, help develop us is so that we would understand that in the world there's going to be deception. There's going to be craftiness. There's going to be cunningness. And he says here again, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, notice what they do with their craftiness and their cunningness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. So deception is just crouching. It's, it's just waiting for us to be blindsided. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So it's about growth and maturity. At the heart of these demonic wiles is a lying spirit, a lying spirit. See, you can't deceive and manipulate and blind people without lying. So at the heart of all of this is the capacity to lie. The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. So he has to perfect these things through the systems that influence people and perfect them well. Those who fall under the influence of this demonic wow have not developed the ability to distinguish truth from error. The anointing within you will always register in your spirit an error alert. I'm going to say that again. The anointing within you will always register into your spirit an error alert. I'm almost done for the day. I want you to go to me in 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 7 through 11. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 11. Now we're living in the hour where the Mystery of iniquity is already at work. What we see in terms of lawlessness, it is because that is the characteristics of the hour that we have come into. When you begin to read the context of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 11, you'll begin to see that there is a man of lawlessness that is to come. But the spirit of that which he will bring is already working. A spirit of lawlessness. So the Bible says in verse 7 through 11, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. So in other words, that refers to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who restrains. That word let means restrain. The Holy Spirit is restraining the, the, the unveiling of the man of sin, the lawless one. But the spirit of that is already working. He says, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Don't you thank God that his demise has already been predetermined? Mm -hmm. 
and he shall destroy the brightness of his. He, dest- he shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Notice what's combined. Power, signs, lying wonders. Power, signs, lying wonders. Much of the lying wonders are already working. Not there's going to be some supernatural something or another. It's the spirit of that thing already at work. Lying wonders and with all deceivableness. That's deceit, deception of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now, the ones who are deceiving themselves are perishing. Notice this, because they receive not the love of the truth. And I said before the introduction, the only thing that's going to help you and I literally defend off or come back is truth. Truth. And so he says here, because they receive not the love of the truth, the love of the truth is Jesus. I am the truth, I am the life, I am the way. That they might be saved. That's the only way to be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, what's our answer? Here's our answer. First John. First John. Reliance upon the anointing. The only way to really deception proof ourselves from the spirit of deception Spirits of beguilement, spirits of blindness, spirits of manipulation is the anointing. You and I have to rely on the anointing. We have to rely on the Holy Ghost. Here, 1 John 2, 20, 21 says, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. Look at that. That's so profound. And ye know all things. In other words, you can discern. You can discern. And you know all things. And you know all things. He says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Look at verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, not that you don't need teachers, but the Holy Ghost is the best teacher. He's the best revealer of truth. But as the same anointing teacheth you in all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it have taught you, you shall abide in him. Now. So the anointing. It is critical to recognize how the anointing operates in our lives to safeguard us from deception. We got to rely on this. We got to trust the anointing. We got to trust the Holy One. We got to trust the the Holy Spirit living in us to register truth in our spirit, to literally reveal to us when we are under beguiling influences that in the midst of the stuff that's being spawned all over the place, all over the time, 20 hour, 24 hours a day, we can know the truth. And so the anointing refers to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit guiding the perceptive believer. Notice this. I want, to, I want you to get this. The anointing refers to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit guiding the receptive believer into the fullness of God's will. Receptive. So we got to be receptive. Say that with me. We have to be receptive. We have to be receptive. Amen. Because if we are receptive, amen, then we're going to be able to perceive John's Gospel, chapter 16. I'm almost done. John's Gospel, chapter 16. And I'll finish this up next week. John's Gospel, chapter 16. Notice what it says, verse 13 to 15. Amplified classic. When he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, 
the whole full truth. He will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell you whatever he hears from the Father. The Spirit of God will start speaking. He'll start telling you this is not true. That's error. That's deception. That's mind manipulation. That's mind blinding. He will give the message that he has given unto him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honor and glorify me because he will take of, receive, draw upon what is mine and reveal, disclose, declare, disclose, transmit. Three words, declare, disclose, transmit. The Holy Spirit will begin to declare, disclose, and transmit truth to us. Transmit it to you. Every Thing that the Father has is mine. That is what I meant when I said that He, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine and He will reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit it to you. So we can expect that God is constantly declaring things to us. He's constantly disclosing. That means to uncover things and He's transmitting to us true reality. The truality of his will, the truality of his word, the truality, reality of what's going on. The scriptures tells us to test all things, prove all things, not to believe everything you hear. What I'm saying, I'm saying that we are to never believe what we hear. Am I saying that we are to become skeptics? No, we are to try and test the spirit that's in operation by the Holy Spirit within us. I'm going to say it again. Are we not to believe and become skeptics of everything? No. We are to try and test the spirit that's in operation by the Holy Spirit within us. In him, there is no error. So in other words, you can't miss it. When we test what's going on, when we, when we prove what's going on by the spirit of truth that's in us, will never fall prone, prone to error. Now I'm almost done. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Here's the scripture. Notice what it says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. It says, but test and prove all things until you can recognize, recognize what is good to that whole fast, to that whole fast, again, but test and prove all things until you can recognize what is good. Keep testing, keep testing it, keep proving it to that whole fast. What does it mean to prove? It means to try to test. The so, the so, to show something is acceptable or real. In other words, we, we, we begin to investigate. That's the testing. Investigate it. Put the test to reveal what is good, genuine. It means to prove by testing. It's done by dem demonstrating what is good. So in other words, we have to analyze it long enough to prove whether it's true or false, whether it's right or wrong. It has to pass the necessary test. Disproving something to show it to be bad, to test. By implication, it means to prove, to put to the test, to prove, to examine. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to examine it in light of the truth of God's word, in light of the spirit of truth that lives in us. I distinguish by testing. I approve after testing. I am fit. What it means is I, by discernment, look for the patterns that are consistent with the thing or inconsistent with the things. So in other words, if I'm going to investigate, distinguish, and to prove whether something is real or false or deceptive in nature, I have to look for, I have to discern patterns. I have to discern patterns. And here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, and I close with this. Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but prove tests. 
the spirits to discover whether they proceed from God. For many false prophets have gone forth into the world. Behind everything that the enemy is trying to do, there is a pervading spirit at work. We have to test. We have to prove. Satan has mastered the systems, and in many cases, he influences the systems that govern the thinking of the masses. Deception is a 24-hour-a-day operation as it pertains to his control over the world. And I want us to just pray. I really want us to pray, and we'll deal with the rest of this next week. Right where you are, I want us to pray that we're going to pray that God will give us the ability to really discern and to listen with, with a circumcised inner ear and to hear a thing and to distinguish whether that thing is actually true. There is so much information bombarding us in this hour that's calling a destabilizing influence on not just all of humanity, humanity but, but even on the church. The church don't even know what to believe. Should we go to church? Shouldn't we go to church? Is the virus real? Is it not real? Is this really a, you know, is this really a pandemic or is it not? Did it suddenly go away with the riots and the protests? What is it? We need to be able to discern. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that the spirit of truth lives in us. We thank you, Father, that you deposit within us the ability to distinguish truth from error. Father, you have placed the spirit of truth within us. You have placed the light of your love within us. Lord, you said test all things, prove all things. Give us the ability to test and prove, Lord. To distinguish, Lord God, with such precision, uh, aided by the Holy Ghost, that when we see a thing, we hear a thing, Lord, we're able to distinguish what spirit is that at work there. Am I being manipulated? Is that a beguiling influence? Is, is, is it a deceiving influence? Is it a manipulating influence? Is it trying to alter uh, my, my perception, my, my values, my, the way I think, my ideas? What's happening? What's the spirit of that thing? And Father, we pray even now that even over this nation, those deceiving, deceptive, beguiling and blinding and manipulating influences, Lord, that is governing, Lord, how the masses think, Lord God, destabilizing even this nation. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we will not succumb to those uh, deceiving spirits, those uh, beguiling spirits, Father, those those spirits of blindness and, and manipulation. Father, we know that the God of this age, he blinds the minds of those who don't believe. But we are believers. Our minds should be illumined. We should see. We should be able to discern. We should be able to distinguish what spirit is operating here. What's true? What's false? Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, may we become like the, the children of Issachar who understood the times, Lord, who understood the spirit of the age, who, who, who understood, Lord, what was really happening. Lord, so we'll not ask the question, what's going on behind this? What's going on behind that? That we'll be able to track the patterns of the enemy. Lord, track what he's been doing in the past to see, Lord, as we come to those same similar seasons. Uh, we've seen this before. We discern what's at work here. God, we're not in darkness. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Lord, but we're principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And Father, we pull down those deceptive and beguiling and uh, manipulating and blinding influences, Lord, uh, right here over this nation, over this region, over our, our, our city, Father, over the church. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that we would have the ability to discern what's really at work. Lord, so we'll have pinpoint accuracy 
accuracy in what we're dealing with in the realm of the spirit. Lord, we're just not pot shotting and, and, and shooting blanks. God, in the realm of the spirit, the Lord will shoot the, the, the arsenal of God. The sword of the spirit will hit the mark in the realm of the spirit. God, because we, we discern what's really operating here. Father, we thank you. We thank you for truth to prevail. We thank you for our own ignorance to be dispelled. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that we'll be able to discern a right in this hour. And Father, I pray for these under the sound of my voice today, Lord. We know, Lord, that you're changing the tide. But we know, Lord, we have to confront even these same pervasive, dominating spirits in the days to come, Lord. Help us to walk circumspectly. Help us to walk upright. Help us to walk in such a manner, Lord, that we'll be able to navigate this time, Lord, have a, have a clear word from you, have clear guidance and direction and instruction from you, Lord. We'll be able to, to bear the truth upon our lips, Lord, to those who are questioning what in the world is going on, what is really going on. God, we thank you with clarity. We'll be able to declare the mind of the Lord. We'll be able to distinguish and, and detect and, 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 and begin to, to, to unearth, Lord, and explain what is really going on. So the minds of many will be open. But Lord, we, we, we thank you for the highest reality of what you want to do in this hour, which is reveal the Christ. We thank you, Lord God. In the midst of crisis, the Christ will be revealed. And the church will not be rendered powerless and God will not carry the stigma, Lord, of what COVID-19 was trying to put on us, that the church is no longer essential. The church, through the headship of Jesus Christ, has always been the answer. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for revelation knowledge flowing freely through your church, the bride. We'll carry a clear word. And we'll have the answer, Lord, for those who ask us of the hope that we'll be able to give a true accounting because we know the one who is the truth, the life, and the way. So, Father, I thank you. Let the spirit of truth flow into every home. Father, we thank you. And we give you praise. In Jesus. Now I pray you receive the word this morning.